No. Um, I would say that people play games to get missing emotional vitamins from their lives. In other words, they, they play them for the same reason that they go into uh, movies or ride roller coasters. There is a certain amount of tension and a certain amount of relaxation that is necessary to achieve optimal muscle tonus you know, if you're working out. And the same thing is true of our emotions. Uh, if there is not enough tension in your lives, you'll go out and you'll see aliens. You know, if there's too much tension in your life, you still might go out and see aliens in the same way that children who are hyperactive can be given amphetamines. It kind of kicks you all the way around the circle. You know, you go all the way to the end of yang and you go into yin, right? But if a person does not feel enough emotional challenge, they might do something like uh, identify with a character in a, in a board game and, you know, become a sword-wielding barbarian in general people will often slip into an identity that allows them to feel whole. So often they will slip into an identity that completes them. You don't sound all that enthusiastic about the experience. Is that why you don't play role-playing games? I don't game because it requires pretty much the same type of mental effort that writing does. And I am only going to spend so much of my time exercising that particular part of my personality. It's like doing you know, sit, it's like working on a particular muscle group every single day. That muscle group breaks down after a while. You have to shift the onus of exertion from one group to another, from one system, physical system to another. So I will only spend so much time in any one particular kind of mental activity. I, I will have to shift to something else. It's not, uh, it will also be uh, reminiscent of a busman's holiday. I mean, I, I, I write for a living and I'm not going to game using the same muscles for fun. I'm just not going to do that. Some SF authors are involved in gaming, in the case of Sean Stewart as a game writer. A few years back, Sean was hired to rework the live-action fantasy role-playing game Dream Quest. It's a weekend-long adventure where participants meet monsters, magic, and mayhem. How differently did Dream Quest end up working in the field from the way you had it working on paper? Unbelievably differently. Mm -hmm. um, the, the whole thing was a, a set of flying improvisations. You know, you'd have these conversations that you don't have much of in real life. Like, people would come running up to you and say, Sean, Sean, look, someone took the golden demon ring, but they wore it on their head and chanted the rhyme backwards. It sort of fulfills the prophecy conditions, but it wasn't what we were thinking of. Do we go with it or what? Um, and so you'd be doing a lot of that kind of thing. Uh, if it made any kind of sense, great. But it was, uh, it was not theater for the people who like to go by the script. Right. There was a lot of flying by the seat of your pants. Mm, well, you don't seem like a seat of the pants author. Did seeing Dream Quest in action affect how you laid out the hero's quest in your novel Nobody's Son? Ah, uh, that's an interesting question. I don't know that it's affected me that much because the people who are playing a game have adopt these uh, incredible personas. Um, we, I'd say of the 80 people we would have out, uh, more than 50 of them would be at least dukes. <laughs> Whereas when you're writing a book, um, the people on your quest are real people theoretically day after day after day after day. And so there's a little less of the kind of fast affectation. One of the things that was really striking about doing the quests was how deeply the real people believed in it. Um, it made a great believer in me uh, as far as sleep deprivation goes because that will work miracles for you. If you keep someone on two hours sleep, two nights running, by the third day, he really believes that if he doesn't do this right, the Demon King will get him. And he will do unbelievable, crazy, su subject us to legal action kind of <laughs> stuff um, in order to, to defeat his Demon King. Well, that's funny because when I look at the characters in role-playing games, their heroics seem almost superhuman, but maybe this proves they're not so far-fetched. That's right. That's right. It was... And one of the things we tried to build into the quest, or one of the things I tried to build into the quest when I was writing them is to let people even who are having personas that were lesser lights have key roles to play. Um, so that it wouldn't always be the guy who announced that he was Prince Darlac of Morgothond with the magic rune sword Hawkmoon of the Seven Sundering Heads, um, who was, you know, the key component, but that we all have sort of parts to play and we bring our different strengths into them. As well as the popular fantasy games like Dungeons and Dragons, there are quite a few hard science fiction games. Some are based on science fiction novels such as Larry Niven's Ringworld. Actually, Ringworld is a favorite of avid gamer Pierre Savoie. 
How important is it to read Ringworld first before playing the game? It's very important and very motivational to read the novel first. Uh, I had one player I tried to introduce to the game of Ringworld, uh, uh, and he was moderately interested. The other players urged him to read the books, so he said, all right, all right. After a few weeks, he did read the books, and he said, these books are fantastic. They're great. Why didn't you tell me to read them? And, they, and we all told him we did, and he said, yes, but you should have forced me. Can that sort of role-playing game give you any additional insights into the book? A uh, role-playing game, if it's well done, can very often be an encyclopedia of a given set of novels by a, a science fiction or fantasy author. Uh, the information is very well organized. Uh, it has sections on the geography and history and the population of the imaginary world. So it's a very effective reference. It becomes almost a source book of the novels, even though it's intended to be used uh, for a game. So you can learn a fantastic amount of information. Uh, the games often end up having to build on the author's work and add much more detail uh, that aren't suggested in the novels themselves. Actually, the novels are often shorter than the rule books. TSR, the biggest publisher of role-playing games with their 24-sided dice and their little lead characters, also publish novels set in their games worlds. Novels filled with lead characters. Still, something to read while you're waiting your turn. But one gaming company, Games Workshop, is putting out interesting novels under the guidance of David Pringle, the editor of the highly respected British SF magazine, Interzone. Yes, I work, when I'm not doing Interzone, I work for uh, Games Workshop, a, game, a large games company in Britain. And um, they set up a small unit called GW Books to publish fiction based on the backgrounds of their games world. There are three basic games. There's one called Warhammer. There's one called Warhammer 40,000, which is set 40,000 years in the future. And there's one called Dark Future, which is set in the near future. And... Um, I've been commissioned to edit novels and short story collections based on these three scenarios. And I've in fact been given quite a lot of freedom just to get good stories. We don't have to, they don't, the stories don't have to conform to games rules particularly. They just have to conform to the background, the imaginary world in which the, these fantasy games are set. Yesterday on the Genie bulletin board system, someone was raving about one of your books called Comeback Tour by Jack Yeovil. What's it about? Um, Comeback Tour is a dark future novel in which Elvis Presley is the hero. And it's great fun. I mean, it's a sort of adventure story, full of violence, but at the same time very funny because it's set in an alternative near future world in which Elvis Presley didn't die. In fact, he never left the army. He stayed in the army, became a real tough fighting man and gave up rock and roll altogether. And it's about set in the late 1990s and about a middle-aged Elvis Presley, but very fit, looking a bit like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And um, you know, it was full of of the most delightful sort of uh, invention and lots of um, amusing action and uh, it's as though these writers can just let their hair down and have a bit of fun and sort of be boyish if you like be childish but retain a lot of their talents and abilities when they're writing this kind of fiction games workshops novels are so entertaining because david commissions top sf authors like ian watson brian stableford kim newman and then the writers make a game of it uh, Nancy, I have two pairs, two red kings, two black kings. Can you beat that? Another royal flush? Jeez, you bartles. Wait a second, if I had four kings, how could you have a... The entire system is meaningless. I'm Enrico Bruin, and this has been Second Nature. With the USSR gone, who controls the Soviet's vast nuclear arsenal? Next week on Second Nature, we present, Dad, Can I Borrow the Keys to the ICBM?